Okay, so this is our first example, and what we did is created the new entity class. And an entity class, you can imagine, in our case, just as any object that is, exists in the Isaac world. So this could be a rock, a tinted rock, a chasm, or whatever that you might find on the floor. And of course, every entity that exists has a name. It also has a few parameters or attributes, like X and Y, so th those are their positions relative to the map. We also have the property of destructible, so is the item we are trying to destroy actually destructible? So if that property is true, that means that we can destroy it, and if it's false, that means we can destroy it. We also have a property of is exploded, so has this item already been blown up yet? And of course, if it has, it's true, and if it hasn't, it's false. And the last one, which is called reward chance, which means how much chance does this particular item have of actually giving us something for destroying it. So that, that might be zero if we're talking about ordinary rocks or if we're talking about tinted rocks, which have like a 50% chance of give, giving us a payout, uh, we would set this to 0 0.5 in our case. Okay, so we create a function new. So this is our constructor, so to say. This is the function that serves as to create our class or object whenever we want to do it. And what it does is it takes three parameters because of course it is a function and it can take three parameters. In this case, the parameters we send it are tinted rock, true, which stands for it is destructible, so it is true, and the reward chance we have when we create this object, so 50% chance of actually getting something. So what this does is creates a new empty object, it fills it with these default values and variables or names, and what it does when it's created this object, it gives it a name of whatever we sent into the in the function as a parameter. So the name of the object becomes the name we sent as a parameter. And the, the, the property of is it destructible becomes whatever value we sent it as, as a parameter of the function. And the same goes for reward chains. Our second function here is set pause, which is, is short for set position. And the only thing it does here is it takes the self function or the self parameter, which we talked about, is just a hidden parameter that you don't have to worry about whenever you call it with a colon, and two more parameters called x and y. And what this does simply is just sets the self's position to whatever we send it into the function. And the coup de grace of this whole example is the explode function. So let's imagine you have a bump, and you see the blast radius, and you see that in the blast radius there was a bump or a rock that can be exploded. So you would call this function explode. So this is the function that then handles the explosions and the rewards maybe. So in this case, of course, we also have the self parameter, which is hidden because we're calling it with a colon. And this, this is referring to the actual object that is calling it. So in this case, we created a new rock called tinted rock. So whatever we do to it only affects this particular object. And we can reference that object by using the self parameter. Because Lua is a bit weird, you actually have to use the random function more, multiple times, at least on the Windows system, at least on my system. Um, so that's a bit odd, but if you just run the random function three times, what ends up happening is it's going to give you a random number between 0 and 1. So that means that numbers below a half are actually 50% likely to appear, and of course, the same goes for numbers above a half. So you can actually use that as a way to simulate randomness in game. And that's something that is going to actually come up quite often. And I'll go into more detail when I actually make a separate video for these useful functions that you can actually use. But for now, just, just remember that it generates a random number between 0 and 1, and you can use that then to create something or not something, depends on what that number is. And you'll see when I run it, just kind of how it works. Okay, then we check if the rock that, or the object that is calling this function explode is destructible and we check if it's already exploded. So if it is destructible, so if it's true, and at the same time it hasn't exploded yet, then we go inside the function. So of course if the item is not destructible then we're not going to do anything, or if the item is already destroyed we can't do anything either. We check if our random number is smaller than our reward chance. So if our reward chance is a half, and our random number is between 0 and 1, that means that 50% of the time uh, this will actually execute. So we will just print out to get a spirit heart, and we will set the property of itself to is exploded to true, which means that the item has exploded. So then we have a function called prints, which is just simply a function that prints out the properties of our entity, and this is something that you can do for every single entity. So instead of just having to write four prints, for example, and say, 
a print name, print destructible, print x, what you can do is just write a function, again, use the parameter self, and just print out that self name and self x and y and self reward chance and self is exploded. And if we do this and just run this program, we can see what ended, ends up ha happening in this situation. Okay, so we can see that the name of our object that we used, so we call the first print, is tinted rock, its position is 0, 0, the reward is 0 0.5, and destroyed is false, so it hasn't been destroyed yet. We see that the random number is that the Lua has generated, which is about 0 0.19, and because this is lower than a half, we say, okay, you get a spirit heart. So we just print out the properties again, and you can see that at this point, it's, it's destroyed property set to true, which means that at this point, the rock doesn't exist anymore. So if I run this program again, maybe, and again, and again, and again, you can see that this isn't really working. And the problem is uh, the, the randomness, this random function is just acting a bit weird. And what you have to do to kind of make it work is use a, a something called a random seed. And you, you call this once in a program, I, maybe I just put it at the top just for example's sake, and what ends up happening is that the seed that it generates is its random number, it's gonna use the time of the operating system. And I didn't wanna kinda complicate this before, but it's important to see what happens if you don't use this, that you're gonna get the same number over and over again. And in this case, what it does is just take your time to, to the millisecond, I think, and it just creates a random number. And you kind of have to generate it three times to really make sure it's random, because if you only ge generate it once, there are some complications. Basically, it's a, it's a weird process. But you kind of have to use this if you want an actual random number, and then when you're generating a random number, you just have to call the function multiple times on certain systems. On certain systems, it just works if you call it once. So now we can see that the numbers are actually random. So this, in this case, it was 0 0.75, and in this case, it's 0 0.48, and again, 5.7, and depending on how big it is, it depends if you actually get a reward if, or if you don't get a reward. And you know, I, I made a, sm a slight blunder here, and you can see that self is exploded, is true, is only set if we actually get a reward, which is not exactly what happens, right? Whenever you destroy something, um, we, we we can determine whenever you destroy something, even if you don't get a payout, that item is already destroyed. But for, for the sake of experiment, I just wanted to show you that uh, that a property is only destroyed or changed in this case if it actually explodes. So this is may maybe like a rock that you can use multiple bombs on and it only actually explodes when you get some reward out of it. So that's maybe a bit far-fetched, you know, but, but for the sake of the example, just kind of bear with me for this time being. So this is it for our first example, and I actually have another one, which I'll get to you in a minute. Okay, so this is our second example, and we were urged to create two objects, one of them, or classes, one of them is called enemy, and one of them is called player, and they have actually the same attributes, HP, damage, and name, but have different functions. So let's look at them. So of course, both of them have the new function, which is just used to create a new object. So a new player object or a new enemy object, it has three attributes or three parameters in the function. So the HP we wanted the enemy or us to have, the damage we wanted to have, and the name we wanted to have. Then we just create our new object like before and we return the object as a, a form of a associative array. Then we have the function called kill, which just prints out the message that the enemy is dead. And in this case, it does nothing, but what you could potentially do is also that it has a chance of giving you a reward, or maybe the reward is guaranteed, or whatever. But, you know, the function itself, it can contain anything you want, but in our case, it just writes out that the enemy is dead. We have a function called is killed, which just checks if the current enemy has less than 0 HP or whichever object is calling the function, and if it does, it calls the function kill. And you might be wondering, well, can't we just join these two together? Well, first reason is I want to show you that you can actually self-reference functions that exist in the same object. So in this case, of course, self-kill references itself, so whichever object is calling and calls a different function inside that object. And the second reason is maybe for some reason you want to have separate functions for these two things. So maybe you want to check to happen maybe every loop and you just want to be able to execute the kill. So to just kill the enemy with outside sources as well. So that's maybe another reason why you would have uh, two separate functions instead of joining them together. And we also have the function called print, which just prints out the enemy object parameter. So enemy and his name and how, how much HP he has. <laughs> 
And the player object is virtually the same, the only difference is it only has one function, which is called shoot, and has two param parameters of self, which means who is shooting, so that's whichever object is calling, so that's self, and it has the enemy we are shooting at. And of course, we are then subtracting the enemy HP from our HP. If I wanted to be very technical here, what we could actually, what we should probably do is create a function inside of the enemy, which kind of reduces its HP. But for the sake of having two classes, this is how I did it. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just maybe a bit stylized, maybe a bit better if you have a way of dealing the damage to the object inside of the object and you don't end up doing this, which means you have to reference a different object from within this object, which is sometimes can be a bit wonky. But for this case, it just works fine. So we create a new player character, which has 100 HP, five damage, and we name him Isaac. We create a new array of enemies. So like before I said, you don't have to create one by one. You can just create an array of enemies. Like in this case, we create five enemies because the, our loop goes from one to five. And on every loop, we just create a new enemy that has uh, random H3 from one to 20, that has random damage from one to five, and it has a name of brains dot dot E, which means that the first enemy will be brains one, brains two, brains three, etc. And then what we do is kind of simulate shooting. And so we go, we shoot, we, we pretend that we shoot each enemy five times. So the outside loop goes, repeats five times and the inner loop kind of goes to every enemy that we shoot. So we just go to every enemy. And if that enemy is still alive, which means if they have more than zero HP, we shoot them with our function or that we used, uh, that we wrote in our object. So, or I mean in our class, but we call it with an object. So when we call this function, player shoot enemies of J. So in our first iteration, we are shooting the first enemy or brains one. So we can see what happens, right? We can see, okay, we kill the enemy or we shoot the enemy, self enemy. Okay, we reduce their enemy HP by however damage the object that this function is calling has, and that's it. And then we perform a check. Is enemies of J, so the one we were shooting now killed? And then we print out its stats, so how much HP he has, what's its name, etc. So just that we have a better look at things. What you could potentially do is also put the this check here. So you could say, okay, um, enemy is enemies enemy dot is killed. So what this would do is it would shoot the enemy, but it would also check if it's killed. But for just for the sake of having these things just a bit more spread out so you don't have to rely on having different functions in functions and then you know maybe you don't have as much uh, control over particular things i think it's better to do it this way it's also much more intuitive that you see the, f the first thing we do is shoot and then we check if it's killed we don't have to go in the functions and see what the, what the hell that function does and whatnot this is just like i said a bit more readable i feel so if we run this we can expect a few things to go let's just see how this simulation goes okay so first we shoot the first enemy and he's reduced to 11 whatever HP. Then we shoot the second enemy, so he's reduced to 0 0.55 HP. We shoot the third enemy, 10 HP, fourth enemy, 5 HP, fifth enemy, HP. Then we check is enemies of, or if this enemy has, or again, we I would say we repeat the same process and we check if the enemy is dead, that's what I want to say. And if it's not, we, we keep shooting it. So in this case, it has six HP. And then we shoot the second guy, so the second enemy, brains two, and we can see that it dies because this is what happens first. First we shoot it, and if it dies, then we check if it's killed, and if it's killed, we print out that it's dead. And then we print out his, print out his HP. So in this case, it's minus four, which indicates that he really is dead. And we kind of re keep repeating that, and we only keep shooting enemies that are still alive. So you can see in this case that we managed to kill all enemies in, in five hits. And that only makes sense because what I do is generate a random number from 1 to 20 for every enemy, which means at most they can have 20 HP. And when we shoot them five times, that's 25 damage. If you have five damage, and that ends up killing all of them. So in the end, you can see how this little simulation uh, works. So this, this you can imagine, this is actually you shooting the enemies. And these are the functions that are being, that are being called. So now some of this is a bit confusing, especially how to create certain uh, functions or these constructors or whatever. But what I urge you that's most importantly whenever when we actually get to modding what's most important that you actually know this notation the columns and how to use the dots and the functions that is that exist inside because what we're going to get is just a giant class from whoever developed the game and we we'll, then we'll use that class to kind of access the data inside of the game 
just like very similar to how we ac actually access the data in this case. So I hope that these two examples were enough. I understand that some of these uh, things, or at least at this point, there were a lot of things we covered. So this, at this point, I would say that this is actually all you have to know to really start making some really complicated, mod, complicated mods. And the next two episodes of our tutorials won't actually tackle the things like this anymore. So we're not actually going to learn how to use the language. I'm actually just going to showcase more of the things that this language can also do, some functions that are very useful for us or that we can kind of take advantage of so we don't have to write all, our, all the code ourselves. And even more importantly, I'm actually going to provide a bit more examples on certain topics. So if you're watching this and you want to know more about a certain topic, or I said in the previous video, if you have any item ideas that maybe you would see like written out, this is the perfect time for you to, to kind of say it in the comments. I'll take a look at it and then I'll consider making an example on that case. Okay, so this is the end of the classes topic. And this is actually the last one that will actually cover concepts that we can use inside the language. So the next videos will focus more on examples and some actual functions that exist inside Lua or maybe some usabilities, more so than us actually learning loops or whatever. And I hope that that will be a bit more interesting. And of course, I hope that everyone was able to kind of come to this point that has watched. And of course, if you have any questions, any non-understanding, misunderstandings, please ask. Uh, I would more than I would be more than happy to answer or make a separate video or just explaining those things. And and hopefully, you know, this way we can learn together and create some really awesome mods when actual Afterbird Plus comes out. Thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you next time.